Hey guys, Norm. I'm here at Maker Faire 2012 here with Sandra Rose, who's one of the creators of the Viper Project. Now, tell me a little bit about the Viper Project. What is this? Uh, what we've tried to do this year is make a fully immersive flight simulator um, based on the TV show Battlestar Galactica. So yeah, you basically you get in it and you strap in and the uh, virtual world that you're flying around in is displayed on some screens. As you fly around, the cockpit that you're strapped into moves to orient itself uh, like the virtual plane that you're flying. And it's not just the virtual system, the cockpit moves like 360 yeah. degrees, it's a full motion control system. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 360 degrees continuously on uh, both the pitch axis and the roll axis. Very cool, and it's just you and four other friends from high school. Uh, yeah, myself, a couple other friends that uh, you know, we've worked together on past Maker Faire projects, uh, our parents, yeah. And have you guys had experience building a motion control simulator before? I mean, what other past projects have you guys worked on for Maker Faire? Um, in past years, we've made uh, Sephira, uh, an animatronic fire-breathing dragon. Um, last year, a couple of the kids made a, um, a system that kind of uh, works with Rock Band, and as you play, uh, instead of having little fire poofs on the screen as you hit notes, they're actual fire poofs. Uh, we've also made um, potato cannon Gatling guns, I think that was like three years ago. Yeah. Very cool. So for this one, how did you start? I mean, where did you guys go to start researching making a motion control simulator? We looked at a lot of other uh, simulators, like mostly race car simulators, there seemed to be a lot of those. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we kind of started with a, an old uh, 1960s Piper Aero airplane fuselage that we found at a salvage yard uh, and kind of worked out from there. So we built out uh, the interior with um, a Recaro racing seat and a six-point harness. Um, and then once we had all the dimensions of the, uh, the cockpit, we uh, built a CAD model and um, started designing the, the frames that would kind of nest inside each other to uh, give us that 360 capability along two axes. So inside the Virtual Flight Simulator, uh, you're using open source Flight Gear software. Is that modded so you're fighting Cylons? Uh, unfortunately, not yet. Uh, we'd eventually like to get there, uh, maybe you know, download a, a 3D map of Caprica City or something like that. And then I saw you guys did a Kickstarter to get help funding for this, along with some sponsors. Uh, tell me about that and, and how that went. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we originally planned on uh, getting corporate sponsors to, to fund the whole project. Um, but when that didn't completely fold out, um, my brother is super awesome at making videos and that kind of stuff. So he made us a promotional video and we, we put up a Kickstarter campaign and raised about $12,000 in about a month. Uh, so that, that really kind of boosted our spirits. Um, and then through other donations of um, separate parts and also just money, um, we've managed to basically fund the entire thing. Awesome. So it's, it was you, four friends, and a few parents, and each of you guys had a specific skill. Uh, what was your role in this project? Uh, I did a lot of the mechanical design, a lot of the electric design, you know, designing the PC boards and that kind of thing. And this is kind of a diagram of the electronics and software. Um, so inside the cabin we have three 22-inch monitors that display the virtual world in which you're flying around in. Um, and we have a, a fully functional, tangible instrument panel with a couple uh, iPhones and an iPad displaying like radar and engine stats and that kind of thing. Um, along with a couple just, you know, market joystick, thruster, that kind of thing. All those things are linked to a, a PC that has a couple pretty big graphics cards that are running all this. Um, so since the, the simulator we're using is open source, uh, we can pretty easily grab packets of data from the game and we're getting acceleration and orientation data. Now the PC collects all this and sends it through Ethernet to the operator computer, uh, which takes that and sends it to an Arduino inside the control panel. Uh, and that Arduino is running a basic uh, proportional servo loop, finding out where the where the motors are right now. Where, you know, what's the orientation of the cockpit? Because we have some shaft encoders too, um, and then figuring out where the cockpit needs to be, and then turning that into motor controls, um, which are then sent to the motors, and the cockpit turns to match that new orientation. Well, and then right now, uh, how many inputs do you have? So you have two joysticks, a throttle, and uh, you guys have three monitors, so it's it's, it's all pretty well linked together. Alex, when he was making the computer, he, he specifically picked out all the individual parts to maximize the number of USB ports. I think we have 16 or 17 USB ports, and right now we're using all but one. Wow. Um, because there are iPhones and iPads which all need to be plugged in, and there are also three Arduinos behind uh, this instrument panel, as well as another one in a separate component. So there's like 
six USB ports for RS Duino, or Arduinos, and then like three more for the for the iPhones and iPads, and then the joysticks, and it's just it's crazy in there. And the first thing you guys did was build out the PC because not you didn't build out the whole flight control system first, and you tested it on Lego, a Lego model, right? Yeah. Legos are much easier to build and change than a full welded metal frame. Um, so we built that first uh, to kind of give us an idea of what it would look like, and also we were able to test our our control software and our servo loops on something smaller and less dangerous uh, before we actually moved it up to the big platform. Yeah, we have this uh, this fuselage here. This is the one that we picked up in the salvage yard. Um, to reinforce it, um, we've built this roll frame here. This is what we're calling it. And this runs all the way underneath and attaches to some critical you know, structural elements of the fuselage. Around it, we have what we call the pitch frame. Um, so the roll frame spins inside the pitch frame. And the pitch frame spins inside of the A-frame, which is uh, what's you know on the ground. Um, we're doing that through two one-horsepower motors. Um, these are 1750 RPMs each, and uh, we have a 100 to 1 gearbox right on the end of that. Um, so we get about 17 and a half RPMs, which is about one revolution every three seconds. Uh, and it feels pretty fast when you're in there. And all the data right now you said is just Ethernet from those three monitors, from all the input systems, to a control computer over the control board. Yes, we're using a little bit of wireless for the uh, the less critical parts. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a, like a webcam in there that's uh, to wirelessly to monitor, but um, all the really important things that we don't want to flake out are wired, yeah. So I'm here with Alex Jacobson, who worked on the software and electrical systems for the Viper, but right now he's the pilot. So Alex, can you tell me a little bit about the instrument panels you have inside? All right, so in the panel, in the inside the cockpit, we have the instrument panel, we have the environmental status panel, and we have the engine selector. So there's three different parts, and of course we have the screens. So we'll start with the engine panel. So on the engine selector, we have uh, three switches that you basically, as you play the game, you flick these guys up, press the start button, and then you click over to green and turn on your engines, just like in Battlestar Galactica. On the, on the environmental status panel, we have uh, four things. Two are sound level, one is a binary counting of, uh, of your system time, and one is light level to check to see how bright it is in here. Um, the last one, the most important one, I think, is the control panel, which has tons of buttons and LEDs to tell you all about what's going on in the game, and do, it does actually interface with the flight, uh, flight simulator in-game. So like you press the parking brake or the start button, and you'll actually start the game or play, take off the parking brake, lower the flaps, raise the flats, uh, gear up, gear down, all that stuff. Um, then we have two controllers, and a master game power, and then some lights in here, and then we also mounted a GoPro to see uh, to look at the uh, the uh, flyer, and then also the last thing is we have a webcam to so the operator inside can see who who's flying and make sure they're okay. And then lastly, the funniest thing we have is the emergency stop, which says "Don't push" in masking tape, and uh, we actually had two people push it so far. So how does it actually feel inside when you're flying it? So when you're like flying it with the harness on, upside down, rolling around, it's like it's like the best feeling in the world. Like especially because I like I've helped make this, so you're just like, yes, this is mine. I built this. I get to keep it, play as long as I want, kind of thing. It's just like the greatest feeling. I'm a little biased, but I think I'm the I think I'm the best pilot because I have landed it successfully on the tarmac uh, three or four times so far, which is quite hard because you have to start about two miles out and then basically put your engines to 10 percent and then just glide in. You gotta be able to land on the tarmac before you can waste some toasters, right? Yes, tarmac is very important. <laughs> All right, cool. And you're interfacing with the uh, the control board over there with a the webcam and, and a headset, is that right? Yeah, so outside we have the operator console and all this stuff we can see outside. So we have the webcam so you can see the person, we can see the screens, we can see where they are, we can see all the position data, so where they're supposed to be versus where they should be. Basically everything is going on here. All right, so I'm here with Sam Frank and Joseph Rose. Uh, they're here at the operator console for the Viper. Uh, tell me about what you guys do while the, uh, the, the, the Viper's running. So we have one screen here, which is an internal webcam feed on here. Uh, this is a basically a main monitor system, so we can monitor pitch and roll, degree angle accelerations, that sort of data. Um, over here we have a actual uh, physical control panel, which has analog control, so we can um, com like completely control the motors manually, and a big stop button in case something goes wrong. And we also have a comm link going, so I can talk to the pilot inside, and they can talk back to me. Uh, Miracle, what type of uh, feedback do you guys have to give the pilot uh, when the pilot's running the, the simulator? 
So we basically just give them the okay to go, we get them all situated and level in the actual platform and um, make sure nothing goes horribly wrong and we're, we're just keeping uh, talking to them back and forth to keep them comfortable and that sort of thing. And Sam, did you, you built the, the PC and the system here for this, uh, the, the Opera console? Yeah, I helped design the parts for it and I didn't actually put it together, that was uh, Alex who did that, but yeah. Um, Everything inside is, is custom made, so yeah. And Joseph, you also did something pretty important for this project. You did all the video production and photo production for the Kickstarter, right? Uh, yeah, and I also did a bunch of the stuff inside, so all of the iPhone panel control uh, little picture things, which aren't actually working right now because of the accelerometers, and the uh, iPad, uh, the Dratus, which is like the, the radar in the show. So all that was uh, pretty much made from scratch and stuff. And then, yeah, I also did the Kickstarter and the promos and all the weekly updates and all that stuff. So Awesome. So for the iPad inside, uh, did you look at the TV show and then find look at the animations and recreate it? Yeah, unfortunately, we tried to find a like a screensaver um, of the Dratus and then just use that and put it in the iPad, but we couldn't actually find one that could be manipulated because all of them had like alarms going off and ships flying around. And since it is a kind of a, a dormant run, no big action yet, uh, we couldn't have any of that, so I actually had to go and kind of recreate one for myself. It was kind of fun, actually. So, yeah. Eventually, do you want to get it to be interactive so they can the controller can actually t touch the iPad and uh, affect the simulator? Uh, well, that we're not really thinking about having the, the iPad control. We are definitely thinking about having a more theatrical element to it. Maybe have like some ships jump in. Maybe get some weapons on the ships since you can mod them out in flight gear, and then have probably like a, a part where you can fly really high, and then your engines give out. And you got to restart as you're tumbling through the air in a controlled fall. Kind of fun. And have you flown the Viper yet? Uh, yeah, actually, yesterday was my first time. I don't think any of us have really gotten a good flight uh, before yesterday without it breaking. So that was it was kind of a landmark. So I'm here with John Boyer, who was the mechanical designer for the Viper project sitting right behind us. John, what other simulators did you look at to base your design off of for the Viper? So when I was designing the frame, I looked at our fuselage and I looked at our design docs of what we wanted it to look like as a final product. And I sort of designed something around that um, based off what connections, what structural um, features of the cockpit we had. And I, I sort of designed around that to make something as compact and, and functional as possible. Where did you guys find the fuselage? The fuselage we found in Sacramento, we went up to an old boneyard and we convinced the owner to sell us this fuselage, which is a 1964 Piper Cherokee. Um, and so we got that, put it on a trailer and brought it back to San Rafael and began measurements. Um, we made sure we knew where all of the, like we're using the wings bar, for example, as a big structural connection. And so we, we thoroughly inspected the plane um, and then started designing a cradle around it um, to be part of the motion platform. Were the other fuselages available? Like, you have other options? What made this one ideal for this project? I mean, this was the closest to what, to what our sort of vision was for the project as a final. Um, it was, we got, I think, the whole frame for about $100. And the guy just, he removed the nose, he took off the wings, um, and then he, he basically cut off the tail with a big saw. We didn't do much else to the frame besides paint after that. The motors took a while to source. We had to do a lot of calculations, figuring out what's our moment of inertia going to be. Um, and at first we were looking at like 20 horsepower motors. Right now we have two one horsepower motors, one on each axis, with a 100 to 1 gearbox. And that's enough to spin it up to 17 RPM in about three seconds. And so we hit our performance goal very closely with those. The reason we tried to get the motor power as down as, down as much as possible is any higher than about one or two horsepower, you have to go three-phase power. And you need a special generator for that. And so there were parameters like that that we were trying to hit as far as designing the system. So we wanted to keep the weight down as much as possible and generally keep the power down as much as possible to make it simpler. And then you guys chose a, three, a full 360 motion. Um, why did you guys choose that instead of a, something that didn't move as much? So our decision to make two axes of 360 degree motion came from a trip to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum a couple years ago. Sam DeRose went and he flew in the simulator there that's a ride there and said, hey, this is really cool. And that one has full roll capabilities, um, but the pitch is limited. And we said, and this was a couple years ago, and he said, hey, I would love to make one of these sometime, but we're going to make it better. And so back in October, we met up for the first time and he presented this idea and it, it sort of came out of that and we just we decided to sort of try to one-up them and add this another dimension of of motion Battlestar theme also right and the Battlestar theming was Sam also he's a big fan of the show I just started watching the show but it's it's cool so far and I feel like I'm getting some of the references from it um, and that's that's our aesthetic theming is the Viper from Battlestar Galactica awesome well, thank you John thank you so much and congratulations on the project thank you